Everyone, my name is Sarah Flournoy. Thanks for the introduction, Susie, and thanks to the Native Plant Society for having me. I really consider y'all friends. Um, I love the Native Plant Society. So I'm hopeful that we're going to be able to do a landscaping for birds class in the future through the landscaping certification program. So kind of keep your eyes open for that. Um, and uh, we'll get started here in a second. Um, I guess what I'll just tell you is that um, I went to a program that Houston Audubon put on. Um, Andrew Farnsworth was the speaker, and he's an ornithologist who studies um, migration. And I was so struck by it. And I really have always thought migration was fascinating, um, but seeing his talk made me kind of want to spend some time putting a presentation together. So this is hot off the presses. Uh, we'll cover a few minutes about bird migration and then a few minutes about plants. Um, so I hope you enjoy. We'll start off with some beautiful birds. And these are the ones we're going to focus on today, our migratory songbirds. So we have the painted bunting, the prothonotary warbler, the Baltimore oriole, and the rose-breasted grosbeak. And these are all birds you can see in our area. Uh, if you've ever seen one of these birds in the Houston area, would you raise your hand? OK, good. I'm glad you have, because the rose-breasted grosbeak is um, kind of what I would call my gateway bird. Um, I was at Russ Pittman Park. It sounds like there's an event there coming up. And, um, and I saw my very first rose-breasted grosbeak not that many years ago. And I was shocked that a bird that colorful was so close to home. Um, so that was my gateway bird. And I've since, um, now I work for Houston Audubon. So somehow I went from that to this. <laughs> So the quiz question for today, I got it working, thanks. So. Um, the quiz question for today, how many birds migrate in and through the US each year? Is it thousands? Is it millions? Is it billions? Or you must be kidding me. <laughs> how are we supposed to know that? Um, we are just now really having good data that can tell us the answer to that question. So we have projected through the years how many birds migrate um, through the US. Millions, billions, millions, billions, billions. Lots of citations, but we've never been really as sure as we are today. Um, Using NEXRAD radar, we have been able to more accurately measure the number of birds that pass through. So just recently, in the last few years, we now know that three and a half billion birds uh, in the spring travel north across that southern transect into the breeding grounds. So from their wintering grounds into their breeding grounds, three and a half billion birds. So that's along the whole northern, uh, the whole southern transect, and a big clump of that is the Gulf Coast. Um, and then the birds go and breed in the US and in the boreal forest. And then they migrate back down um, in the fall, where you see greater numbers of birds because they've been busy reproducing. But I'm hoping you are ooing and aahing inside at just the great number of birds. <laughs> Something to keep in mind for us right here on the upper Texas coast, well, we're one of the most important spots for migratory birds in the entire US, which is great if you enjoy birding. So some dates to keep in mind, the greatest, conservation, the greatest concentration of birds in the spring of migratory birds will occur between April 19th and May 7th. And so we fine tune that with radar and with eBird citizen science observations. So those 19 days, if you can, get out and go birding, because you'll see some of these gorgeous birds. So I mentioned the NEXRAD radar has been really crucial to understanding um, numbers of birds. But it's not just that. They've layered on different um, measurement tools. So there's the NEXRAD radar. There's the um, eBird, so millions of people create, making observations um, and entering it into their phones and on their computers on what birds they're observing. 
Um, in addition to these, and I thought just thought these were pretty cool, the one on the left is a little GPS backpack tracker. So what it does, it, it's a little bit bigger. The technology every day is more capable of being smaller, so it can go on smaller birds now. But this little backpack um, can speak to a satellite, so you can ping it, so scientists will ping it however many hours of the day they want to, a certain time of day, um, and they will be able to track exactly where the bird's going. So you can measure a couple things. You can measure where it's migrating, but you can also measure where it's foraging, like on Bolivar Peninsula, where a, a single bird may be moving to eat. Um, the technology on the right is MODIS. Um, so this is a smaller little receiver um, technology that's placed on a very small bird. It's lightweight, it has an antenna. And so when this bird um, travels within eight miles of that tower, the tower will ping it. It will know um, whoever banded the bird in this new technology, with this new technology, will then be able to go online and tell where that bird passed within eight miles. Pretty cool. So why do these birds migrate? Why are they moving through? Uh, probably many of y'all know this, but um, it's food. Their, their primary reason is they're, they're looking for a food source. Um, they have wings. They're able to travel longer distances than other animals. Um, and they are moving not only just for food, but so they can reproduce, having the food to create the next generation of birds. So where many of our migratory Nearctic, neotropic migrants spend the winter is in the tropics, so in Central and South America and the tropics, where there is a lot of competition for food, um, and I guess less diverse food is what I've been told. And so then what they do is when they migrate north to their nesting grounds, they go into more of this temperate area. That kind of looks like the eastern US or Canada. And that is where the leaves on the trees, for example, are leafing out and then supporting all the Lepidoptera species that those birds can then forage on to feed their nestlings. So, they're traveling to that area in order to have food to feed their nestlings. And then they turn around and do it again. Uh, so a few uh, interesting species and their migration paths. This is a Swainson's warbler. And if you go online, you can see these um, occurrence range maps. And so, for example, in the winter is blue. So in the winter, that's where the Swainson's warbler um, is living. And then the yellow is migration. That's where you can see it during its migration period. And then the orange is where it's breeding or nesting. And so if you look, there actually is a little bit of orange kind of in East Texas. So you can see these Swainson's warblers singing and breeding just a little bit north of here. The magnolia warbler has a different range. You can see its winter grounds. Um, it has a big migration uh, path. And then it's really going pretty far north um, to breed into the boreal forest before it turns back around to its winter grounds. The indigo bunting, you can see its uh, wintering grounds, its migration, and its breeding. And I wanted to show you kind of a a neat bit of technology using eBird. Hmm. Okay. Well, let me see if I can. Hold on just one second. Okay, so follow the date. We're moving. We're moving into the winter, February 22nd. This is a heat map showing population densities and how the indigo bunting moves throughout the US. Wow. So it's migrating through the springtime. Some birds are reaching their breeding ground. And then you see the indigo buntings moving south again. Now, this is all just using citizen science data. So if you have not accessed eBird before, just go to eBird.org. Um, it is an 
very powerful tool where you can learn exactly which birds are in our area, which times you can manage your life list. And um, it's a very important part of understanding the way birds move. All right. <laughs> Oh, here we go. This is a, um, a, a, a shorebird, the red knot, and I really just wanted to include this because the red knot, um, its migration path is really incredible. So the wintering grounds in blue and the summer breeding grounds are in orange. So you see how far some of these red knots will travel from the very southern portion of South America all the way up to their breeding grounds. Um, so 9,300 miles to the south where they'll breed and then turn right back around and go back down. And they have nonstop flights of over 1,500 miles. So multiple days flying and migrating without stopping. For us here in the Houston area, many birds leave the Yucatan Peninsula, and they'll either um, migrate around the around Mexico and the Gulf of Mexico, um, circum Gulf migrants, or they'll travel across the Gulf of Mexico, trans Gulf migrants. And we've been just now learning that there are birds that leave the northern tip of South America and travel 1,800 miles nonstop. So they, they leave a nonstop. And where are they arriving? Right about in our area. Most of these songbirds are migrating at night. So it's interesting to think about at what time they're leaving the Yucatan Peninsula and what time they might be arriving. If you're a birder, you want to you know, know when they're going to be arriving. Um, and so it's interesting to think about that. They're using celestial features and magnetism as part of their migratory guides. And this um, scientist, Sidney Gotro, he realized that birds migrate at night at very high altitudes. So typically, um, you're not going to see the birds migrating at night, though there's now technology that can pick up on their sounds, their night calls. But with, when the weather conditions are good, they travel as far as they can and then go down to rest and refuel. When the weather conditions are against them, for example, if there's a, a, a storm front, it will push against the birds, and the birds will then descend, and they'll either go land. Um, this little bottom part, portion says bay, marsh, trees, field, and gulf. Sometimes this will be something called a fallout. So many people have uh, recollections of seeing all sorts of birds, like on the ground, on the on. Uh, some even come up to their feet, covering trees. Those are typically birds that have had a very hard journey, and they've had to come down to rest and refuel. Um, but it also this happens with storms. Um, so what, what we were trying to do is educate people that birds do migrate at night, and that if we want to help birds, it's important to keep our light um, limited. So when birds are migrating at night and they hit a storm front and they come low, lights cause disorientation and birds may um, collide with buildings or continue to fly around in circles because they can't escape the light. Um, and then they tire out and die. So we have an action alert program where people can sign up. This is one in the fall. We also do it in the spring where people can sign up and um, pledge to turn out their lights. And we're really, we're really trying to get some of the buildings in Houston to get on board with this. Galveston has had some good success because they had a, um, a bird fatality. And actually, it was a tragedy, but it ended up being a really good education opportunity. Birds also do migrate in the fall back south. It's a longer migration. So we're in spring. It's really concentrated. In fall, there's, um, birds are spread out over more days. And then it's also, if you're a birder, it's a, um, a special challenge, I'd say. Because if you look at that bird in the lower right-hand corner, that's a chestnut-sided warbler. Well, as a matter of fact, that same bigger bird right there is a chestnut-sided warbler. So it's in its fall, more juvenile plumage. And so if you get bored with identifying the um, chestnut-sided warbler in the spring, you can bird in the fall. 
I wanted to make the point that when we talk about helping birds, my, my usual presentation is just about all the way we can help birds at home and on all scales in Houston. Um, but when we help birds with plants, you're helping your resident birds too. So these are the birds we're seeing year round. So these are cardinals, blue jays, our owls, our chickadees, our woodpeckers. Um, they're, they're here, you know, they winter here, they nest here, they breed, they have, they have their babies here. Um, and so when you help migratory birds, you help all birds. To hit home that not all birds are here at the same time of year, this is a graph um, graphic from eBird. For example, look, and I think this is from the Arboretum. I think I took this from the Arboretum. So you can see, for example, that um, the Blackburnian warbler, right there in the middle, has only been observed in early May where the pine warbler has been seen almost throughout the entire year. And the northern cardinal has definitely been seen throughout the entire year. So you can generate these things easily on eBird. And it can help you kind of know what you're going to see when. I wanted to invite you, if you're intrigued, how many of y'all would call yourselves birders? Like, whatever that means to you, you'd identify yourself as a birder. Okay. So I'm hoping most of you then have been to High Island. Um, but if you haven't, Houston Audubon has 17 sanctuaries in the upper Texas coast. And the, where it says Boy Scout Woods and Smith Oaks, those are our world famous High Island um, sanctuaries. And in the spring, it's a blast. Um, so the, the classic birding routes that I think are more pretty much a full day is you go east out of Houston, go to Winnie, and then go south in Winnie to High Island. Um, you can hit the High Island sanctuaries and see what all that's about. And then you can go south along the Bolivar Peninsula to Bolivar Flats Shorebird Sanctuary. A lot of people, I happen to have a certain fetish for songbirds, <laughs> migratory songbirds, but a lot of people like um, shorebirds. And you can um, explore the shorebirds there and see the beach. And then you can take the ferry across to Galveston, explore some of the Galveston sanctuaries if you like, and then head on back home. That's like a real classic route. The other alternative route is Winnie south to High Island and then just go right on back up to Anahuac National Wildlife Refuge, which has wonderful birds as well. So I'd encourage you, particularly in that 19-day time period, if you have a day to go exploring, I'd recommend it. At High Island, which is a salt dome and has interesting plant communities, um, we, Houston Audubon, spent every day is doing habitat restoration. Uh, to support these birds that need um, the, these places. And uh, when you drive into High Island, there's Fifth Street where Boy Scout Woods is, that um, dark orange rectangle on the bottom. And that's where you can check in. Volunteers will tell you, give you a map. They'll you know, tell you how things work. And then Smith Oaks Sanctuary um, is where we have a rookery where Rose, I heard roseate spoonbills have just started uh, making their nests. Um, so great egrets, roseate spoonbills, cormorants, and you can really see those birds year round. Because you're plant people, at least if you're here, I think you're plant people, um, if you go check in at High Island, this is a fun project that I've been working on with a few other folks. Uh, we call it the barnyard, named after the woman that donated the property, but literally, this was like a real rundown. I think someone told me it literally was a crack house. Um, and so what we did is a real traditional lot, and we just tore, we, we tore down the house, and we decided let's do a real easy, low-maintenance um, habitat. And so we brought in hay from Nash Prairie. You can see in the front, I tried to do these test plots with seeds that failed miserably because you can't control plants that well. Um, and then we did a path. And so this was maybe two years ago. And then that was, I think, a year later. Um, so we really had great success. Um, I like that <laughs> verdant environment, but some people might think it looks overgrown. And then just recently, a couple, uh, about a month ago, what we did is we mowed it and then burned a little bit of it. Um, and it was neat that we were able to burn some of it as a restoration um, technique, even though it was in this um, residential area. And you'll see, just take a look at it when you go to High Island, because I think you'll enjoy those native plants. 
If High Island's too far away, we do about 12 monthly um, urban bird surveys. So you go out for two hours, there's an experienced birder there to greet you, you help count birds in an area, collect data, and then just enjoy a nice bird walk. So you can check out these sites on our website and we welcome anyone. Okay, so let's shift to, that's birds. I mean, we're gonna go over some resources because this is just like a touch of a taste. But let's shift to, um, to plants. And the last time I was here, we really hammered in that point about the plant insect bird connection. So 98% of songbirds feed insects to their young. So if you want more songbirds, if you want any songbirds, you have to have insects. So if you want insects, you have to have the plants that those insects are adapted to eat. So they're host plants. So what you plant is crucial to birds. Um, so you can see that all these birds are eating insects that um, Wilson's warbler, uh, Carolina chickadee, great crested flycatcher, and um, is that a hooded warbler? Hooded warbler, eating a tiny little spider. So I'd like to propose two concepts for y'all to consider. Houston was covered in two primary habitat types before we came in. So prairie and these riparian quarters. Okay, so prairie and riparian quarters. This was an old map I found that kind of suggests that. So in your yard, uh, what would it look like to be inspired by prairie, by a prairie plant community? You're not gonna make a perfect prairie in your yard unless you're really lucky and have a really nice space to work with. Um, but you can add elements. So this is a picture taken from Deer Park Prairie. I mean, even if you look in just like one foot by one foot, the plant diversity is really phenomenal and, and beautiful. So how can you take that concept, um, it's sunny, um, it can be wet, it can be dry. There's slightly different you know, plant communities will go in the little higher spots, other plant communities down the little lower spots. How can you recreate that in a way that um, looks attractive in your home and um, that you can manage? So if you, you might create a sunny, cheery patch. So what I'd like to do is start at the bottom. So I'm suggesting that you consider um, ground cover instead of mulch, so a green mulch. So some ground cover options might include frog fruit, spot flower, or lyre leaf sage. So that's gonna, that's gonna cover up your weeds, so um, you don't need mulch. And then you can add your um, sunny, cheery flowers, your black-eyed Susan, Texas coneflower, wine cups, blue sage. You might, you know, be a little adventurous. What speaks to you? You might want to add a swamp sunflower, a little blue stem, um, or one of the golden rods. And then you might have a place for a vine, like coral honeysuckle or cross vine. But the idea is that you're inspired by prairie and that you're building in layers. So here are what some of those plants look like. The bottom layer here is your lyre leaf sage that's blooming right now all around town. Um, the Texas frog fruit in the middle, the spot flower on the right, and spot flower is a really little flower. That picture makes it look really, the bloom look really big. And then the nice wildflowers um, like the black-eyed Susan, the blue sage, the wine cup, and the Texas coneflower. And then the add your own independent spirit plants, the Maximilian sunflower, the little blue stem, Goldenrod. Do we know what kind of goldenrod that is? Anyone? Anyone? And then the um, coral honeysuckle. Here are some examples of people in Houston that have taken this concept. Um, on the upper left, some of y'all might know Betsy Black. She has a great yard in Bel Air um, that just transforms every month that looks different. And then Russ mentioned Lauren Simpson, the garden on the right, who is um, a phenomenal leader um, in native wildscaping. And then um, I think this was Aaron Stoley's garden on the lower left um, who loved wildflowers. 
Maybe you have a shadier environment and it might be more appropriate to be inspired by a riparian woodland. This is the Columbia bottomlands. So here it's dappled shade. A woodland does have sun. I mean, it's not just complete canopy cover. So dappled shade um, and some leaf litter that birds love. Same concept. Start with your functional ground cover, your Virginia creeper, lyre leaf sage, salvia coccinea. Add your mid-layer, narrow leaf wood oats, sable minor, turks cap, American beauty berry. And then add your small trees and large shrubs, parsley hawthorn, Mexican plum, wax myrtle, and yopon, creating that layered system. And here are some pictures. The lyre leaf sage again on the bottom, the salvia coccinea, bottom middle, the Virginia creeper, bottom right, and then that mid layer, the sable minor, the narrow leaf wood oats, the turks cap, and beauty berry. And then the small trees and shrubs, the yopon, the parsley hawthorn, and the wax myrtle. A special shout out to wax myrtle. Um, so I have in my garden, um, I actually am redoing my landscape. It started from scratch, and so we planted our yard in August, and it has been so exciting seeing all these things leafing out. Um, but we planted three wax myrtles, and we decided to clump them together to create almost like a wax myrtle thicket. And then we put a little water feature that's just literally like a, tr a shallow tray of water underneath those. And we get so many birds in the wax myrtles, including the myrtle warbler. So this is a, win a bird that winters here. It's um, called a yellow rump warbler, also a butterbutt, because it has that uh, yellow on its, on its rump there. Um, but the myrtle warbler obviously is named myrtle warbler because it likes the wax myrtle. So while this is less of an insect connection, I think it's eating the um, fruits of the seeds of the wax myrtle. And I would be remiss if I did not show this Doug, Chal Doug Talamy chart. So when we're talking about the plant, insect, bird connection, um, trees have such a significant biomass. So let's just look at this chart here. If we know that we need plants that support um, insects, Lepidoptera, caterpillars, then we might as well plant trees that do that. So our oaks and our cherries, plums, willows, they're supporting 532, 445 species of Lepidoptera. That's a lot of insects. Or if you go on down to some of our non-native plants that our landscapes are covered in, honestly, um, like your uh, crepe myrtle only supports three. The golden rain tree only supports one. The nandina supports zero, and actually the nandina berries are toxic to birds. Um, and I see nandina everywhere. Um, I think nandina is still on the market um, at a lot of our nurseries as well. But um, you know, you really start to see that what you plant matters, and so canopy, you know, choose your canopy trees wisely and aim for diversity. This is, okay, so this is from Doug, what Doug Talamy did is he really, um, he wrote Bringing Nature Home, and he, in, in his area in Delaware, he looked at, um, he studied this, he's an entomologist, and so he studied how many Lepidopter species are supported by each, um, you know, grouping of tree, and, um, and then what we did is we just took those that are native to Houston and created this chart. Uh, Susie was nice enough to mention Houston Audubon's natives nursery. So if you wonder, well, where in the heck am I supposed to get these plants, which is a challenge. Um, we have a natives nursery that <clears throat> offers, you know, I think we probably have 70 different species right now of plants, and we're working to diversify even further. Um, I want to show you, I don't think I have a map of where we're located, but we're located at Edith L. Moore Nature Sanctuary. And where that is is out Memorial, just past the Beltway. It's um, a wonderful place to walk around. There's Rummel Creek runs through it, and you just park right at Edith Elmore and come to our nursery. We are 
open on Friday mornings um, from you know, 8 to 11-ish. We're pretty casual. And then we have open houses that are a little bit more structured. Um, when you come on Friday mornings, there are plant experts there to uh, consult with you and help you and load up, help you load up your car and things like that. And you can also email us at nativesnursery at houstonaudubon.org if you have special questions. Um, for this group, I wanted to mention that we rely heavily on our volunteers that come out are very committed to our Natives Nursery. So if that's something you might feel called to do, please apply to be a volunteer online at Houston Audubon. And it's, I mean, we have a lot of fun and we have good snacks and, you know. Like. <laughs> a couple plant sales coming up that I thought y'all might want to know about. One is going to be here. Okay, it's going to be um, here at the Arboretum, April 19th and 20th, and it's a partnership between Houston um, Arboretum and Nature Center, Houston Audubon Society, and Houston Parks and Rec Department, and we're calling it the largest native plant sale in Houston. Um, we'll see if we can live up to that title, but come and check it out, and we'll have everything from wildflowers and grasses to trees, so hopefully you'll find what you need there. The <clears throat> Our Natives Nursery open house is May 4th. Uh, please come and visit us and look online for the details about that. And we're also having a high island plant sale. So for people that are coming birding, we're going to try to entice them to, if you like birds, please come help, you know, get plants to support birds. Um, and then I mentioned that spring migration is here. So I hope y'all will get the bird bug if you don't already. Katie and Lan mentioned the City Nature Challenge. If you haven't already used iNaturalist, uh, some of you might really enjoy it. It's a wonderful online community of naturalists that can help you identify all sorts of things. Um, the, the machine learning is actually incredible. You can take a picture of a obscure plant, and the machine learning will take let, figure out where you are, and it'll compare it to all the other shapes of the plants and all the other data, and it comes up with very good answers to help you identify what your species is. Okay, so the observation period is April 26th through the 29th, and that's when you, if you get, a, it's as simple as if you go to iNaturalist and you make observations, you have to create an account for free. But if you make observations in, in, our, in that area that's highlighted, that will go in. Um, there's also a page if you want to follow along more directly. April 30th to May 5th is when we are going to be making identifications. So those of you like <clears throat> Katie MD um, that are really good at identifying um, plants and insects, um, we will be urging people like that to help us make all the identifications because that leads to more to, of our species count and then leads to us winning and showing how awesome Houston is. A few more resources to let you know about. Um, if you go to the Houston Audubon page and look up bird-friendly communities, or you go to birdfriendlyhouston.org, you'll see this page. The yellow arrows, plant native plants for birds, click on that, or go to get started to find a whole host of resources. If you click on native plants for birds, you're gonna see a page that has all sorts of resources like this, the best plants, learn about the native's nursery, where to buy plants, pre-planned you know, garden ideas. Um, so I'd urge you to go to that to dig deeper, so to speak. As well is a resource that you can download for free. Um, it's a bird-friendly habitat guide. It's 48 pages. This is more designed for like if you're working with a local park or you have an office space that you want to have native plantings, this will give you ideas not only on plants, but on how you might highlight birds, on how you might limit threats to birds, um, and, and how you might plan and, and communicate with your stakeholders. So it's a great resource. I wanted to mention a few more resources, um, including planting in a post-wild world. At the bottom it says designing plant communities for resilient landscapes. And that's what we were kind of talking about with the sunny and the woodland um, examples, resilient landscapes and plant communities. It's not just like one plant plop, it's about what plants you're putting together that we're after. So this is Planting in a Post-Wild World by um, Thomas Rainier and Claudia West. 
I'd also recommend Garden Revolution by Larry Weiner, How Our Landscapes Can Be a Source of Environmental Change. Wally was about to give this book away to someone, but <laughs> this is a book that um, was kind of a, I guess this is a gateway plant book for me because it tells great anecdotes about how plants were used historically. It's really interesting. Remarkable Plants of Texas. Don't forget to get a field guide. These are available online, or I like a paper copy because I like to flip through it really quickly to see which bird looks most like what I'm, what I'm uh, observing. I think everyone knows Bringing Nature Home, but if you haven't read this, this is a primer. Uh, we call it uh, Talamizing or Speaking the Talamaic Vision um, because Doug Talamy has made such a difference for our community. And then I've got two Houston Audubon resources here, simple things that you can do to help birds, keeping our eyes on the birds. You could get that up here. And then a plant list, bird-friendly plants. And you can take this to your, um, you know, your, who, whoever you like to buy plants from. Um, and we sell many of these as well. And that's the show. Thank you, everyone.